Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is Rex Bell. He's going to share some stories about playing bass for the great Lightning Hopkins. This is how I came about playing bass for the Lightning. Before ZZ Top, there was a band called the American Blues. There's Dusty, Rocky, Frank, and a and an organ player. I don't know exactly what happened, but there was a big. I th- the rumor is that Rocky jumped off stage and beat somebody up really bad. But anyway, they confiscated their equipment and they kicked them out of the, the their big gig. They all had blue hair. They were called the American Blues, and they had blue hair. And so one night at the old quarter, my waitress said, hey, there's a guy with blue hair that wants to get in. I said, well, let him in, man. And it was Rocky. So Rocky and I became friends. And then, and then Rocky and Dusty ended up living with me in Dale. We had a big old hippie house. There was a all-you-can-eat buffet next door. We'd go next door, take two black mollies, which is legal speed, eat, go to the old quarter, play all day, open up and play all night, you know. So we had a pretty good little duet working there. And Rocky was living there. Well, Rocky ended up playing bass with Lightning. And I don't know how that came about. But I know when, 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 then when, when ZZ Top was formed, they also picked up Rocky as on a separate as a separate entertainer. And Rocky, bless his heart, a lot of people are hard on Rocky. He can be kind of rough around the edges, but I loved him. He was always good to me. Well, I'm a big Lightning fan anyway. He said, well, play with those records and I'll, I'll get you a chance to audition with him. So Rocky got me that opportunity to play with Lightning at, this, at these black clubs in downtown Houston on Downing Street. Now, it's funny. People say, well, did you feel weird? And I said, not at all. As soon as they found out I was with Lightning, they'd buy me a hamburger and a beer, you know. So I got this opportunity to play with Lightning. And and then I said, well, listen, I can just hire Lightning at the old quarter. So I would hire Lightning for 100 bucks. I would hire a bartender, and I would pay his drummer separately. And so and I was the bass player. And so I just inserted myself in, and then I, I played really good. I played exactly what Lightning wanted to hear. He didn't like fancy bass playing up on the neck. He liked, you know, I don't know if you you know about Lightning's music. He liked those rails to ride on because he liked single notes, a lot of single notes. And so, I, man, he'd want that open A. I say, people ask me how I got to Carnegie Hall. I said, I got there by hitting that open A. Because that, you know, when he was doing in the 12-bar blues, when you get finished with that E and that one, he goes, boom, you hit that four, and light, and we just go like that. And that got that got me in. And I also changed Lightning's life and career. I, because of the old quarter, I turned him on to a whole new segment of fans, the white college crowd, who, you know, he had mainly a black audience before that. When the old quarter really opened up a whole world for lightning, because I was paying him a hundred bucks. It wasn't too long after that. Mickey and I were we with the Hemorrhage Mountain Boys. We were like promoting shows. We would buy the radio ads. We would print the posters, and our band would open up the Hemorrhage Mountain Boys. Then Mike, the drummer, and I would back up lightning. So we had this compact show with the opening, and he, we were paying him five hundred dollars a night right after that. So. I upped his pay scale also. He was he was a lot of fun. I'd, I'd take him around. You know, we took we'd we'd take him around shopping in different places. I would go over there. We'd go over there and practice. But Lightning used to say, "I don't need to practice." And of course, he had to practice to be as good as he was. But he claimed he didn't. And so we'd go there and we'd go through like five songs, and then we'd watch the Astros and drink beer all day. I wasn't so comfortable with the Lightning that I was shooting dice with him. Uh, I always felt like I worked for Lightning. And, I mean, we didn't have a buddy-buddy relationship like Towns and I, you know. But we had a good relationship, and he knew that I cared about him, and I took care of him. And I introduced him to a lot of new gigs. And he and he reciprocated by hiring me a lot of times when he really could have hired the other guy who wanted the gig really bad. Did these audiences realize... What a legend he was. You know, we were packing pretty big places back then. I'm sure they had to. I mean, he was amazing. What charisma. And, you know, he played with one thumb pick and one finger pick. But, boy, could he make it sing. And he liked those open strings. You know, there's a funny thing, and a lot of people, it's an insider thing, but people called me Rick for a while because, 
we our equipment guy was named Rick. And one of it was a Steamboat Springs, it was one of our big shows that we promoted. And we paid lighting, you know, we we, we, had, we had to make sure the and he got really loose on that first set. And Mickey even said, Lightning, you got to straighten up. You, you know, he said, okay. He got up there and I told Lightning, don't give me a, a, a bass solo. You know, I wasn't a bass solo kind of guy. I could do it, but it was lame. About three songs in, he goes, take it, Rick. Because <laughs> he was drunk. And from that moment on, all my people around me called me Rick at the day of the gig. From then on, every time I played with Lightning, my name changed to Rick. Just with that one, it, it, he didn't do it any other time ever. Just that one time when he said, "Take it, Rick," and I was going, no, 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 you know. He didn't like it up on the neck anyway. I don't know why he even gave me a solo. That's why I knew he was drinking. And when he started playing slide with his gin bottle, that was the that was it. But he usually would still stay good and smooth and he was still smooth he could smooth it over but he was loose drunk that night and we chastised him well mickey did i didn't was he using that uh de uh, pickup in the sound hole and plugging into a guitar amp? yes and but then he he also played the the solid body fender he switched to that and i'll tell you <laughs> i need to tell you about the wah wah pedal fiasco he came in, and this was one of the several times he played the old quarter. He came in the old quarter with a wah wah pedal, and he did not know how to use it. It was, and he was fumbling with it, and it was, a, it was his new deal. He couldn't wait to use it, and, but it really distracted him, and he couldn't use it with the shit. He just it wasn't comfortable, and it sounded terrible. It was everything bad. And I remember one night in between sets, I unplugged it, and I told him it was broken. And I hate to do that to him, but it was terrible. And he he kind of got over that because we were we were worried about it. It was that big. It was as bad as Towns's fiddle playing. It, besides that, it, it distracted him completely from his playing. It was really a fiasco. And he didn't, you know, he just found this new thing. And I understand his yeah. his reasoning, but boy, we couldn't wait to get rid of it. He appreciated the fact that the old quarter. He knew that the old quarter actually turned him on to a new audience and he he could he had to be financially appreciative of it because then after that his audience was mainly white i mean i'd say 80 percent and that was not true before that so you know it's like it was like a and he but he talked about his yeah he talked about the the, the, the old days and they were good days too and he was really big in the in the black community and he made some great records back then too and he he played that some, and then he t he turned with me. To, he kind of got into that solid body Fender, and played and started playing that more. He played that at the Carnegie Hall, and Armadillo Ward headquarters, and some of the other big gigs. He kind of transitioned a little away from the acoustic because he loved a band. He would use the acoustic when he had just a bass player, or by himself. But when he had the full band, he he loved the sustain of that electric guitar. Because he was a sustained sustain note kind of guy, too. He would love, especially if he had a bass player and a drummer that was right there with him, you know. Yeah. And you could tell when he was enjoying himself, he'd just, I mean, he'd just mind his head like that. You won't want him to be like that, like that, when he was doing, when the other guy was playing. And I always had to be, I always had to be stage right, because I had to watch his hands. One thing Lightning would do is, he would play this 13-bar blues thing, and that's what, that's what really got me the gig is the fact that he used to vamp in E. He played he played almost all the songs in E. I mean, he played 80% in E. But he would vamp in E, and because he liked to talk, you know, he was one of the few people that talked to people. He would talk to the audience while he was vamping. Now, I, got, I stole that whole thing. What is the blues? What is the blues? You know, and I got this whole comedy bit I do. What is the blues? The blues is when you pick, put out your trash and they pick up your car, you know. But he would vamp in E. And what he would do is, when he was talking, the t his talking would become the first verse, first part of the verse. So a lot of bass players didn't understand that that, that A was coming, but I would pick up on that, and then he would, and then he hit that A, and it was really kind of wasn't at the right spot. But I knew where the talking stopped and the and the song began, and I would hit that A at the right time, and that's what he would do. When he nodded his head, man. That was that was good. I was at a, a friend's house in Austin. I was a phone call, and I, you know, I was at my house in Houston when they had the funeral. But I, I just didn't. I'm not a big funeral guy. 
I know Rocky was down there at the church and picking on the steps and all that. I just didn't want to be a part of that. I, I had no. I mean, I respected Lightning and I hated it. I mean, he, he was about to take me to Europe. You know, he had, we had gigs playing in, in uh, Japan and Russia and uh, some places you'd never think they were going. You know, so but it wasn't. I mean, I wasn't bummed out because my chance to go to Europe. I mean, but it was on the horizon, and pl- playing with him was a prestigious thing, man. It was. I mean, that, well, you were cool when you were playing bass. <laughs> the cool feature the factor just hit the roof. He was one of the all-time greats. He was one of the all-time greats. 